Hey everybody, I'm Marcellino D'Ambrosio, Dr. Italy, and in this third video in, in the Catholic theological tradition, we get now to start talking about the first great period of theology, the period after the New Testament, the period that we call the patristic era, the time of the fathers of the church. Let's first of all ask the question, what is a father of the church anyway? I mean, we've all heard people talked about as the church, a church father, a father of the church. What does that mean? Where's a good list that we can find of them? Well, guess what? There's no official list because it's not an official title. Why are they called fathers of the church? Well, think about this. Why is the Gulf of Mexico called a Gulf? It's a big saltwater body, it's huge. And the Sea of Galilee, that's a freshwater lake, only a few miles wide and a few miles long, it's called the sea. Why is that? Well, someone started calling the Sea of Galilee a sea and the Gulf of Mexico a gulf, and voila, it's stuck. So this is kind of the, what happened with the fathers of the church. In the first theological controversies in the fourth century, big ones, and there, there's argument about scripture, argument about what scripture means, how to interpret scripture correctly. So the people in that era in the fourth century would say, let's look at the fathers and let them guide us. And for them, the fathers were teachers who can help them understand apostolic teaching. Now, if they were dead, the only way they, these teachers could be of help is if they had written, if they had left their teaching in writing. So the fathers of the church are writers. There are many great people in the early church who are not fathers of the church because they didn't write. And if they did write, it wasn't about doctrine. It wasn't about revelation. It wasn't about the word of God. It may have been about a persecution. It may have been about a martyrdom. But the fathers of the church are those who somehow, either in writing about worship or specifically, explicitly teaching about the divinity of Christ, about lifestyle, about morality. These are the ones who wrote things along those lines that are known as the fathers of the church. Now, who are they not? How about... Timothy, how about Barnabas? No, no, no. The apostolic era, the apostles and their immediate disciples don't count. They're in an era all their own, the New Testament era, the era of inspiration, the era when revelation was still happening. Revelation, we understand now, is closed in the, with the death of the last apostle. Really, revelation is closed in Christ. But the last apostle, the last eyewitness, the last official eyewitness of the resurrection, when that person dies, then there's no more new revelation. Now it's a question of unpacking. Now it's a question of understanding that revelation more deeply by probing it. So the end of the New Testament era is the beginning of the era of the fathers of the church. There's a little overlap, perhaps. We're not sure because a lot of our dating is imprecise during this time. But who are the fathers of the church? You'll hear a stock definition that you should forget about, okay? The fathers of the church are those characterized by orthodoxy, antiquity, sanctity, and church approval. It's not a really helpful definition. First of all, antiquity, how far back? You know, Alexander the Great, uh, you know, Paul, no. It really starts, you have to have it define a time. We're really talking of about 100 to 800, okay? Uh, you'll see reasons a little bit more why about, but, but that, that's a specific era, okay? How about um, orthodoxy? Well, the fathers, there was probably no father that didn't have at least some material heresy, except maybe Gregory of Nazianzus. All the other fathers transmit the apostolic heritage, but they also transmit the ideas that come from them um, that, that are, you know, they're, they mean well, but they're material heresy. It includes Augustine, by the way. All right, and we saw earlier Aquinas, but he's not a father, he's after the era of the fathers. So sanctity. Some of the fathers of the church really were incredible saints. Others had serious flaws, and some even died outside of full communion with the church. Okay, church approval? Well, church approval. Um, what does that mean? There's a guy named Tertullian who died outside the church's bosom in a sect, but he gave us our word Trinity. 
he gave us amazing things that we still use and approve of. So church approval is a little vague. So here's a better definition that I want you to learn and know and be able to express, okay? The church fathers are those great Christian writers from 100 to about 800 who passed on and developed the apostolic tradition, okay? The great Christian writers who from 100 to 800 passed on and developed the apostolic tradition. So let's unpack that a little bit, okay? First of all, I want to tell you that they come from a wide variety of times. 100 to 800, that's 700 years. That's a long time. They also come from a great variety of geographical locations, from North Africa to, to what's now France to what's now Syria. Um, you know, um, so it, we're talking and it, all over, it, it, pretty amazing diversity, but there's a linguistic and cultural diversity also. There's Syriac fathers who speak the language of Jesus, a dialect of Aramaic, like Ephraim, for example. There's the Greek fathers. Greek is the first great universal language of the Christian world. Before the church was praying in Latin in Rome, for 300 years it prayed in Greek. And the reason why is Alexander the Great had made that the common language of commerce and of culture throughout the Near East and the Mediterranean world. So everybody in the major cities to communicate with each other in a cosmopolitan Roman world, the Romans just, they kept things the way they were pretty much. They, they all, the great Romans like Caesar, you know, knew Greek inside and out. A pilot would have spoken in Greek. The sign over Jesus' head was Latin, Aramaic, and Greek because Greek was the common language. So that was the language of the liturgy. That was the language of the New Testament. And there's fathers who wrote in Greek. Everybody for the first couple of hundred years wrote in Greek. And then afterwards, that Greek tradition continued to develop with great people like Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzen, um, Basil the Great. Okay, but then Latin. The Latin tradition really got going around the year 200, and you have great Latin fathers like Augustine and Ambrose. So anyway, there's a lot of diversity. The thing I want you to understand is the importance of the fathers of the church. They're witnesses to the ancient apostolic tradition. They help give us the context of the New Testament. They help fill in the blanks of things not clearly explicitly spelled out in the New Testament. You know, did the apostles teach infant baptism? It's actually not 100% clear from the New Testament, although there's allusions to it. But it is very clear from what the fathers tell us they learned from the apostles. Okay, that's just one example. So they're witnesses to the apostolic tradition, to that unwritten tradition. I mean, remember, Jesus lived with the guys for three years before any, before he rose from the dead. And all the boys there, the apostles, they lived with people and taught for at least 20 years before the first New Testament book was written. There's a huge stream of lived tradition that is not captured in the New Testament books. That is the context for those books. That's what tradition with a capital T is, that whole stream. All that the church believes, all that the church is, from the time of Jesus and the apostles flowing down through history, uh, to us. That's the living tradition. And these early witnesses are very critical to helping us establish what that tradition, what that context was. But also, many of these fathers were creative contributors to the tradition. And what I mean by that is they didn't add new teaching and new truth, but they added concepts like Trinity to explain three persons in one God. They came up with formulas like three persons, one God, like two natures, one person in Christ. You know, these things became classic. They helped craft the creeds. The fathers of the church, fundamentally, they are the ones, their era is the time of the first creeds. The canon of the New Testament was completed and formalized during that time. The liturgies that we love so much, whether we're Byzantine from the Eastern or Greek tradition, whether we're Maronite from the Syriac tradition, whether we're Latin, Roman Catholics, uh, the, the, these liturgical traditions of, uh, of language, of imagery, of spirituality, of music, they all took their initial shape uh, in this era of the fathers of the church. So they're really Im incredibly important. But the import another important thing to understand is none of them are individually infallible. In fact, as I mentioned, just about every one of them was wrong somewhere. 
And that's to be expected. You got all these different people from different cultures and different times say, yeah, they're going to disagree. The miracle is when they agree. And where they agree is where they're authoritative because where they agree is not from them. They are, it is coming to us through them. Where they agree is that's the apostolic tradition, the consensus of the fathers. No one is permitted to interpret scripture contrary to the consensus of the fathers. Consensus patrum. That's a phrase from Vatican Council I. Okay, so that's important to understand. They're authoritative insofar as they are in agreement. So if you want to prove something as being part of the apostolic tradition, you're going to look for not one father to say it. You're going to look for two or three or four. In fact, that's an assignment for those taking this for credit. There's an assignment for you guys, uh, an essay where you're going to go over many of the fathers you're studying and pull out some evidence to support uh, certain things um, like the Eucharist, for example, or the divinity of Christ. Okay. All right, so let's talk about um, the doctors of the church for a minute, because they're confused sometimes with the fathers. Some of the fathers are doctors. Not all of the doctors are fathers. The doctors, they, are, they appear in a list, an official list. The doctors of the church are chosen and listed by popes as being extraordinary teachers of the faith. Extraordinary in their teaching, extraordinary in their sanctity, and they can come from every age. It's the Catholic tradition, again, in its most vital moments. So uh, there's a, a list of them on my website. You can go to DrItaly.com and Google, uh, excuse me, just use a search engine on our website, list of the doctors of the church. Actually, if you Google it, it'll be on the first page in a general search also. But it'll show you a little bit more about the fathers. Um, there are many fathers who are doctors, but the, there are men and women. There are medievals and modern doctors. So they span the whole age. So just keep in mind, father of the church, imprecise, customary. You'll find different lists slightly. Um, some people will, won't give the title to certain, a certain author be for some reason, and other people um, will, you know, ha will. So, but the doctors of the church is clearly a list, an authoritative list. And basically what the popes are saying is, guys, take notice of this person. Look at this person's life. Look at this person's writing. This is a reliable place to drink and to drink deeply. Okay, so we're going to talk about an overall 800 years long time. There's a periodization. There is some four main classifications. Actually, there's two really major ones, and it's on either side of a very important divide. It's a date you really need to learn. It's the year 325, the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea, beginning the process of creating the creed that we say every Sunday. I say that because the Nicene Creed was developed and finalized in a second council. You'll learn about that later. But 325 is a date you need to know. Before that time, we talk about the anti-Nicene fathers. And this roughly also means the fathers who wrote during the age of persecution, when Christianity generally was illegal um, and was a capital crime. The Nicene and post-Nicene fathers are the second group, okay? Now inside the anti-Nicene fathers, that's about 300 years worth of writing. You have two distinct groups. You have people that we call the apostolic fathers. They're from about the year 95 or 100 to about 155. And that's because uh, these people are, were alive during the time of the apostles. As a matter of fact, it's, we believe, based on the testimony of some fathers, that these apostolic fathers actually knew the apostles or sat at their feet, at least as children or as young Christians. So there's a very close connection. These apostolic fathers are incredibly important. And we only have time in this course to talk about a couple of them. If you read When the Church Was Young, you can read about a few more of them. All right, But the Didache, an anonymous writing, that is one of the apostolic fathers. Yes, we don't know who wrote it, but we still call it an apostolic father, oddly enough, because it comes from a very, very um, incredible time, probably late first century, uh, as it's put together now and edited, it's probably edited early second century, but man, oh man, is it a wonderful gift that we've only had since 19, uh, 1890s. That's when it was discovered and unearthed. Uh, the fascinating thing about these apostolic fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, 
Clement of Rome, none of them were available during the time of the Protestant Reformation. So Catholics and Protestants did not know the earliest witnesses to the, the apostolic tradition. They couldn't use them in their thinking and in their debating and in their struggle. So it's very important information that we do have now. Okay, now the next group from about 155 to about 325, the, these people, are, we call them the controversialists and the apologists. Apologists because many of them wrote apologies or defenses of the faith to pagan emperors and other pagans. They addressed the world and they confronted culture. And so these guys are the first scholars in the history of the church. The apostolic fathers are very much like the rough fishermen that Jesus picked up around the Sea of Galilee. They weren't terribly educated. They were uh, just um, awesomely practical pastors. Um, but when you come to the apologists and the controversialists, you get people many times who are very, very learned in pagan learning before they become Christian. And they use that pagan learning in many cases to explain and open up the truths of the faith. So they begin this challenge of incorporating insights and things from culture into the faith. How far can you go with that? Well, well they're going to be a, a case study in that. We'll see. Some of them did great. Some of them did had mixed results in what they did. But nonetheless, they're incredibly important. Then we come to the Nicene and post-Nicene fathers from the time of the Council of Nicaea all the way through the, about the year 800. So the first council is Nicaea. The seventh ecumenical council is second Nicaea, and that's 787. And those seven councils, the whole span of them is really roughly the time of the fathers of the church. And we get into the fathers of the fourth century, the fifth century, now we're really hitting the golden era. We call these, a lot of people call this the golden age. The great teachers in the West, Ambrose, Augustine, Jerome. In the East, you have these unbelievable people called the Cappadocians, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, the great champion of Nicaea, Athanasius. So these people, this is just a very intense time. If you read the Office of Readings, I would be willing to wager that the vast majority of the, uh, maybe at least 50%, if not more, of the readings come from the fathers of the Golden Era. This is kind of a classic time. And then there's an afterglow. Um, the fathers of the Golden Age, 4th and 5th century, they're dealing really with uh, the two greatest dogmas, the Trinity, and also Christology, Jesus, who is he, God and man. The successive councils afterwards are all trying to give refinements and to protect the achievements of those two dogmas. So it's kind of like uh, the afterglow of the patristic era. Gregory the Great is in this era. Um, we have a guy like John of Damascus, one of the last of the fathers from the East, Isidore of Seville from the West. Um, th this period is less important than the Golden Age. But th this, this whole wonderful sweep is a very vital, vital time. Uh, when the church was young, th the reason I assign that and we're spending so much time on the fathers is because this era is the time that all Christians look back to with, except for you know, sects like Jehovah's Witnesses, all Christians, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, they are excited about the fathers as well as the scriptures. So the fathers together with the scriptures are basis for revitalization and the coming together of the church. Great ecumenical import, great import pastorally. The fathers of the church were largely pastors. And so if we want a pastoral renewal today, we've got to rediscover, as the Second Vatican Council did, the fathers of the church. Thank you.